welcome to Dreamers to Leaders, Keeping It Real with Melody podcast. Melody is a born dreamer who started from being a flight attendant and worked her way up into now a tech fashion trendsetter, thought leader, and seasoned entrepreneur in multiple successful ventures. This podcast is for the awakened dreamer. Industry icons will share their humble beginnings up to the leaders they are today. Let's all learn and be inspired. Together, we can all prosper. Hello, and welcome to the Dreamers to Leaders podcast. It's the podcast for the dreamers, but more importantly, the doers. I'm your host, Melody. Today, our guest is a Brazilian director whose recent short film has received several awards and is now an Oscar contender. He resides in New York and currently attends the NYU graduate film program. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Gustavo Milan. Hello, Gustavo. Welcome to the show. Hi, Melody. Thank, thank you for having me here. All right. So let's chat about your recent short film. But before we do that, let's talk about you as the creator of this amazing film. Uh, walk us through the journey on how it was for you when, because um, you mentioned you were a lawyer by profession and then you switched into filmmaking. How was that journey for you, Gustavo? That's correct. I was a lawyer in Brazil. I was born and raised in Sao Paulo and in Brazil. And I went to law school and actually worked as a lawyer for four or five years in, in Sao Paulo. And I have to say that the transition from, from being a lawyer to a filmmaker wasn't very smooth. It wasn't very easy for me, but maybe because the obstacles I found were pretty much demons that I had created for myself. They were in my mind. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have like a villain who were trying to stop me to become a, a filmmaker or anything like that. It was just thoughts that I had to fight against in, in my head. And one of, one of the main fights I have to pick with myself was the idea that a successful professional is someone who, who makes a lot of money. And not that I was making a lot of money being a lawyer in Brazil. Uh, I was definitely making more money than I do now as a filmmaker. But um, uh, it was just this belief I had that if you are a successful professional, then you have to be making a lot of money. And that's just not true. So uh, I had to, you know, change that perspective that I had. Um, so that was one thing. Also, I was 28 years old and I thought I was old. Um, to start a new life and, you know, to change, to make such a, cha a big change in, in, in my profession. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, no, but I'm already 28. I went to law school, so I have to stick with this path. Um, and that's also something that I had to work with myself, my own thoughts, and, and, and understand that, no, there's always time to change. And you are always young to make change in your life if you're willing to, to take risks. As they say, um, yeah. all battles are lost and won in your mind first, right? So you really have to learn how to um, conquer those uh, inner voices, right? <laughs> how did you end up then uh, taking that leap with all the with all the voices that you had to uh, contend with in your head? How did you end up then defeating? the other voice that says for you not to proceed. Right. And uh, it was also a challenge for me because I was the first one in my family to um, make the decision of, you know, of becoming an artist. I don't have any artists in my family. So I didn't have any reference. I didn't have anyone to talk about what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't have any mentor or anything like that. But I had a very dear friend who had come to New York and we grew up together in Sao Paulo and he came back from New York. He attended a film uh, making school here in New York. And when he went back to Brazil, he showed me his thesis project, 
which was a very, very low-budget sci-fi movie that he had shot in the streets of New York with pretty much like $100 or if so. Uh, so you can imagine the quality of a sci-fi movie uh, shot with $100. It's not, you can't expect a lot from it. But somehow that movie was very important for me because it showed me that it was possible to make movies, you know, that it wasn't something like being an astronaut or being a soccer player. It's something that you can actually do if you, again, if you're willing to take the risks. So this friend, when he showed me his movie, I was so impressed. I was so mesmerized with his work that I told him that I wanted to work with him, no matter what was his next project. And in fact, he was just starting another documentary in Brazil uh, about who Augusta, one of the, uh, let's say, one of the most uh, iconic neighborhoods in, in Sao Paulo. And he wanted to make this documentary about who Augusta and he was like, oh, you can help me with this documentary if you, if you want. And that was my first experience in, in, in filmmaking. And I knew, I mean, the movie never, for budgetary reasons, we never finished the documentary. Oh. For me, it was so important to have that experience in a, in a small project, something that I could really, you know, be someone doing something for the movie that I knew my days as, as a lawyer were over and <laughs> filmmaking was the only thing I could think about. No, that was just my first experience. And then right after I knew I wanted to make films. So you can, I mean, you can't be, I mean, it's hard to be a successful lawyer and be a successful filmmaker. So I had to make a choice and my heart was in filmmaking. So when so I made the decision heart. that I wanted to be a filmmaker, mm -hmm. I followed and then I went to Paris, uh, where I took my first film school. Um, and only after Paris, I came to New York. I think it was Steven Spielberg that said, I don't dream at night. I dream at day. I dream all day. I dream for a living. So imagine that, um, imagine that short film that was really like a pivoting uh, moment for you watching, watching that film, right? So who knew? that that moment yeah. would change your career path, right? Totally, totally. And up to today, sometimes I, I, I play with this friend. I say, your movie, for me, is the most important movie I have ever seen because it's actually the one that made me believe I could make dreams. I could make dreams in movies, of course. So... It's beautiful. Yeah. And I totally believe, I totally believe in, in what Steven Spielberg said because I shot another project in Brazil in the beginning of this year, 2021, and it came to me as a dream first. During no the, the pandemic, I was dreaming a lot about my childhood in the farm. My, my parents used to have a farm in Brazil, so I spent a lot of time in that farm, and I was, I was constantly having dreams about that farm, and I decided to write about those dreams and that's how the idea for this project came up, the one I just shot and I'm adding on. So yeah, dreams and filmmaking, they are very related. Very interesting, Gustavo. So for all the rookie, um, rookie filmmakers, or for those that are also uh, on a crossroad of wanting to make that leap, uh, similar to your, to your journey, what would be your advice? Uh, for them? I have a professor at NYU that he often says something that I really like. He says, listen, Gustavo, no one will ever put a, a gun against your head and force you to make a movie. <laughs> That's just never going to happen. You know, if you want to make a movie, you have to be the responsible for doing it. Uh, and you really have to, you know, uh, make sure you know the reason why you want to do that movie because sometimes it take up to 10, 10 years to make a feature film. So you better be sure that the story you were telling is really the story that you care for. So I think I would say the most important thing is find a story that really 
uh, matters to you, something that you really believe it's worth taking all the risks to tell. So really fo follow your, know your passion and follow your passion, right? Yeah, for real, totally, uh -huh. totally. And also there's something about when you, I think when you're making a first film, often compare yourself to great filmmakers. Like, um, and I remember actually hearing Steven Spielberg saying that when he was starting his career, uh, he watched um, Lawrence of Arabia in the theaters, right. a British film by Lane, amazing movie, a masterpiece. Right. And he was so amazed by the movie. I mean, he was so uh, stunned by the beauty and by the craft of that film that he thought he would never be, you know, capable of making a movie. He, he thought the bar was too high. And that almost, you know, avoid, almost pushed him away from filmmaking. That's his, um, that's how he tells his story. Because the movie was so amazing that almost like, no, you know what, Steven, you can't make movies. Because if someone else is making a movie that good, then you better stay at home and do something else. So I think it's very important when you are in the beginning of your career to compare yourself with people people who are in the same level, people who are also starting to make movies. You can't compare yourself with Christopher Nolan or all these masters because then you're going to be alone, uh, you know. So, so with regards to um, uh, great directors that you mentioned, what do you think sets them apart? How could one be um, just a good director to being that timeless uh, type of iconic director. What makes one like that, in your opinion? What makes a good director a good director, right? An amazing, iconic director. Um, I think good directors are the ones who take as much responsibility on set as possible. Uh, I think, but that doesn't mean that our director has to know all the answers for all the questions. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, you have to be comfortable not knowing everything. And this is, this is very hard when you are on set because you are on spot. Everybody uh, comes to you asking you questions. Oh, should we do this? Should we do that? Should we put the camera here? Should we use this costume? And you don't have to know all of these questions, but sometimes when you are in the beginning of your career, you feel like you have. You feel like you, you need to know all of the answers. And that's just impossible. It's right. impossible to know everything. So a good director is someone who's comfortable not knowing everything and someone who can rely on, on his crew and on his cast to make uh -huh. the best movie possible. I think it was uh, Michael Keaton... Uh, that said, filmmaking is the ultimate uh, team collaboration, right? So it cannot. Ju yes, you are the captain yeah. as the director, but yeah, you need uh, you need your team and everyone's hundred percent cooperation <laughs> and collaboration to make a masterpiece, right? I agree. Now, with all the directors that are out there globally, Gustavo, what do you think sets you apart? What makes you unique, in your opinion? I'm very interested in, in psychological conflicts. Uh, and not that I'm the only one, but that's something that I know I understand or I'm very you know, eager to talk about. Um, and also, I think growing up in Brazil um, has given me a different perspective of the social conflicts in, in, in Latin America. So being a Brazilian filmmaker in New York, where I'm based now, but also uh, the re because I, I grew up in Brazil and I saw uh, how the society there works and I, I see how these this, uh, conflicts are, you know, some, somehow uh, getting in the U.S., uh, I think I have a I have a better understanding of what's going on in South America, 
and and that's actually what I want to talk about. These are the movies I want to make about movies that can talk about you know Latin America, but also America as a whole. Mm-hmm. So let's uh, let's segue uh, perfect segue to talk about your movie Under the Heavens. Um, so I am excited to hear about the behind the scenes. Uh, more importantly, what inspired you, um, Gustavo, uh, to write and create this film? Well, I shot this movie in 2019, so it was a couple of years ago, and I shot it on the border of Brazil and Venezuela in a, in a city called Manaus. It's not exactly on the border, but it's close to the border, and I flew uh, maybe two or three times to the border of Brazil and Venezuela to make research, uh, to talk with the people, to talk with the immigrants, to understand their situation. But uh, honestly, the story, it's a blend of two different stories. The first story is, of course, what's going on in Venezuela now and, and the, the social and political crisis that has forced millions of people to flee the country. And the other part of the story is something much more personal to me. It's something that happened in my own family. I wasn't born when this happened, but my mother, she, she made a choice of nursing my cousin because my aunt didn't have milk. And my mother made the decision of uh, breastfeeding my cousin. And I'm sure not only because of that, but something in that act bonded them very strongly. And my mother is almost like a second mother to my cousin. They have a very beautiful relation. Um, and, and when I learned about this, I was very uh, uh, just mesmerized. It was like, what a beautiful thing that for me blurred the boundaries of what motherhood can be. But I never knew how to talk about this. For me, it was kind of a mystery um, until this moment when I was in Sao Paulo in Brazil in 2019. And I remember one morning I opened the newspapers and uh, I saw a picture of a woman, a Venezuelan woman um, coming to Brazil. And she was walking on the shoulder of the road holding a baby uh, in her arms. And for some reason, for some reason, I thought that baby wasn't hers. I thought it wasn't her son or her daughter. And it was then that I connected these two stories, what had happened in my family and what was going on in Venezuela. And so that day was the day I, I wrote the first draft. And uh, that's pretty much where the story came from. When, uh, when your PR uh, rep actually um, sent uh, the film, and uh, after watching it, it reminded me of, uh, of a childhood friend who, um, who visited my place. And uh, so she stayed with me here in the U.S. for a few weeks, but she would, she would nurse and she would pump her, her milk um, just so she could freeze them and send it to other mothers that needed uh, milk, that couldn't produce milk. And I thought that was very selfless uh, of her to tediously, painstakingly, I mean, it's not easy to, to regularly have to pump uh, milk and freeze and, and, and have all that um, process and routine done just so you could um, uh, donate Uh, those milks to those mothers that need uh, milk. So, so after watching the film, it, it totally resonated, and um, I thought it would be great uh, to feature to feature your film. <laughs> yeah. With regards to uh, Sorry, some of your, your biggest challenges uh, when making this film, uh, Gustavo, you want to share those, and and how did you overcome those challenges? So, so I think. A big challenge for this movie was just the size of the production for a short film. You know, it's a short film, but it really, it really has a lot going on. You have a truck, you have a boat, you have like a fight scene, you have night scenes, you have all sorts of things that make 
uh, the production very complicated mm -hmm. and um, and also very expensive. So, of course, the first challenge I had was how to find money for 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 this for this movie. And in Brazil, we have a law in which companies can destinate a little bit of their tax money to cultural projects. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have the same thing here in the U.S., but in Brazil, we have uh, that law. And it was through that law that I was able to finance the movie. Um, but what happened was that this was before Bolsonaro took over presidency. Right? Bolsonaro is our president now, and he, he was elected in 2018, but he took over presidency in January 2019, which was pretty much when we were shooting. We were shooting in January 2019. And so I flew everybody to the Amazon jungle, the baby, the actors, the crew, uh, because, you know, I had the money, the government had promised me the money, so I knew I could expand, I, I could hire all these people and all this equipment. But the first day um, we, we received, the first day when we start shooting, we received this notification from the Brazilian government uh, saying that they wouldn't give us the money anymore. The, all the money that they had promised us, uh, it was not going to happen. But for us, it was already too late because we were there in the middle of the jungle with, you know, the crew and the cast and feeding everybody and, and sleeping and paying our bills. And it was very expensive. So, and we received this, this notification from the government and it was, it was, I was desperate. I was like, how, I mean, I don't have money to pay for all of this. And, and my producer, who is a very clever person, a very experienced producer, he was like, come down, you know, um, we'll find a way. This is, we can fix this. Let's talk with our lawyer in Brazil, uh, in Sao Paulo, and we're going to fix the situation. But for me as a director, it was very hard to keep shooting, knowing that I had this financial problem behind me, you know, mm -hmm. almost like a ghost haunting me uh but I, I i needed to keep trying and i need, needed to keep moving forward with the production and, and with the shooting and also in the first day we had a problem with the camera the camera broke it broke down and we lost everything we shot um wow. so imagine in the first day of production of this huge short film you're making uh, you realize you don't have money and you lost everything you shot on the first day. Uh, I, that night for me was horrible. I was, I, was, I was really on the bottom and I had to pick myself up and, and be prepared for the next day. And actually that was the best thing I could do. You just have to keep moving. You just have to keep shooting and moving forward. Uh, and then eventually everything... Uh, went well and we were able to get the money and, and so the and Brazilian government ended up giving you the money yeah but with six months later six months so later. we had to renegotiate with everybody we had to explain to everybody what was going on that it wasn't our fault it was the government fault and people knew what was going on because it was a it was an open thing you know bolsonaro he openly said that he would freeze all the money that was going for the, the filmmaking industry in Brazil. So people so, knew it wasn't our fault. So before, uh, before signing into your project, they knew that that possibility uh, could happen, right? But they believed in your project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was... Yes, uh, exactly. So with regards to that uh, challenge, what is your uh, favorite, your, your, the highlight of the movie? your most favorite the experience that you had? The highlight of the movie. Can I pick two? Two highlights. Can I choose then? two more? Yes. Two highlights. Well, the first one, I think, is the scene in the back of the truck when Marta uh, nurses. And um, we, the, the actress, Samantha, she didn't have milk. So we were not expecting the baby to stay with her or to, you know, to, to stay 
on her breast for a long time because she didn't have milk. And, but at the same time, she wanted to do the scene herself. She didn't want to use a, dub, uh, a stun or, you know, a double. Um, and it was kind of a miracle what happened because the baby just stayed there. The baby, you know, hey. was really hey. sucking. Uh, and, and I don't know if the baby was a great actor. Maybe the baby is just a great <laughs> actor. Uh, and he knew what he had to do. <laughs> but it was kind of a miracle. How many, um, how many takes was that in order to capture that moment? Not many. Not maybe. Wow. Maybe we have a couple of takes. Maybe two takes. Yes, yes. Um, also in, in the Amazon, it rains four to five times a day but it's extremely hot. And that was the first time the baby ever went out of, of her house. It was the first time, the, the baby was three months old. So we couldn't shoot with the baby for a long time. And as a matter, everything was very complicated. So we only had a couple of, of, of tries and we only have a couple of takes of that moment. But uh, yeah, luckily it worked out. So that's the first highlight. And the second one is, the, um, it's almost like this, the last moment in the boat where the mother, uh, Alice, the character of Alice, she hands the baby to Martha. And the actress, she was Brenda, Brenda Moreno is the name of the Venezuelan actress. It's an amazing actress. She was so embodied in the character that she couldn't actually hand the baby over to, to Samantha or to Martha. She just couldn't do it. And I have, I don't know, uh, a handful of takes of her holding the baby and just not doing, you know, the action of giving the baby. And I would say, you have to give the baby. You have to hand the baby over. But she couldn't because she was so attached to the baby. And uh, so that moment for me, you just, you can feel in the acting how present she is and how, how embodied she is in the character, which I love it. I, I hear you. Watching the movie, I could really, I could really feel how everyone was, um, it was so natural because everyone was into character. They really have uh, embodied uh, the, the character. That also says, I guess, a lot about you uh, as a director uh, to to elicit that type of um, of feelings and for to have that full blown uh, cooperation uh, for everyone to really feel to really feel the the movement of of the movie. Let's move into the the takeaways. What would you want your the audience to take away after watching the movie? Melody, this movie. I mean, it's a short movie, and I I don't want to be delusional about the proportions and the impact it can have. Um, so if someone watches this movie and, you know, I, I think this movie, the, the meaning of uh, this movie is about the meaning of abandonment in the world. And, and if you can watch this movie and if you can connect with your own understanding of what abandonment is, then I think the movie was worth watching. Uh, if, if you, by, by the moment you get to the end of this movie, if you connect with your own feeling of abandonment, what it means to be abandoned, and I think it's a universal feeling, I think uh, somehow we are all afraid of being abandoned by something or by someone, then I think the movie was worth watching. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is a short film, but really seriously watching it, there were so many, so many things that went into uh, my head uh, watching it. So uh, number one, I, um, you know, the sacrifice, you know, what people have to endure and, and sacrifice just to live, you know, and uh, be, how really there's people that are just 
not good. You know, there's one character there that was horrible. The, the, the husband of, uh, of Martha or the husband of, um, yeah. That, uh, what was the name of the ca- that character? Yes. Yes. So, um, so, Alice. so human struggles, human sacrifice, um, you know, the immigration problem, things that are for first world countries that they, uh, easily take for granted. And yet you see the plight of uh, this people that had to go through so much to the point of leaving, uh, one's child to find a better life. So yes, it is a short movie, but there's so much, uh, Gustavo that you were able to, to pack, uh, in that, in that film. So, so wonderful work there. With regards to some facts that you personally have learned uh, that you didn't know prior to to making this movie, are there are there any uh, shocking or surprising facts that you didn't know beforehand? There's this great lesson I learned about actors and how to direct actors. Um, before shooting this movie. I was preparing myself to direct actors and I knew that there was so much, uh, the the stakes were so high emotionally that I was really concerned if I'd be able to, you know, to direct them to those places, to lead them to those emotional places. And so I was trying to make all sorts of preparation and reading all sorts of book about uh, directing actors um, and so I cast it, and I had to cast online because my actors were all in Venezuela, and I was in Brazil. Um, so I met them briefly. We talked, yes, we kind of bonded, but it wasn't like a, a real meeting with someone. And But by the time we got on set and we start shooting, what I realized was that those actors, they were coming from... They were leaving, to some extent, pretty much as the characters were going through. They were also living in Caracas in Venezuela. They also saw their friends and their families, you know, uh, trying to escape from the brutal crisis in Venezuela. So they were pretty much embodied in those characters. And as a director, I realized that I didn't have to do much to lead them to those emotional places because they themselves brought them to me. So they, they, they were leaving those emotions on set all the time. All I had to do was just let them be whoever they were and, and they would go there alone. So I, I can't take much credit for the direction of the actress because really they taught me so much. And um, it was just a, a beautiful uh, filmmaking lesson I have. Mm-hmm. So speaking of lessons, you mentioned about the value of resilience in, in filmmaking. Would you want to expound on that, Gustavo? Yeah, I think resilience is the most important thing in filmmaking. It's, filmmaking can be very scary when you are doing your first movie. You know, it's expensive uh, and it can take a lot of your time uh, but, you know, the, the antidote for fear isn't not to have fear. It's to have courage. And to find courage in yourself, you, I think you must believe your, the goal you are pursuing is, is worth the risks involved. And, and so I think the first step for you to be resilient is to actually pick the right movie to do. And we talked about this in the beginning of our conversation, that I think this is probably the most important thing. It's like really choosing what you want to talk about because it's going to take a lot of your time and and it might take years for you to finish the movie. And listen, I know artists who can work on 10 different projects at the same time. I can't. I, I can only work in maybe one or two projects, if so. Um, and, and so finding the, the, the right project for me, it's very important. Um, 
And, um, and yes, and then, of course, because you can't predict how things will happen in your life uh, and how things will happen while making the movie, it's, it's, you have to be resilient because things are not going to work the way you think they are. You know, you be, you be, you're going to face a lot of challenges. You're going to find out that everything you had thought about before is actually not how it's going to happen. So resilience has much more to do with flexibility, I think, than rigidity. To be resilient is to be flexible, to, you know, readapt yourself to the challenges and to, and to the changes. And, um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very important to mm -hmm. be resilient. Um, yeah, and let me add to that, um, going back to what you said about resilience and courage. So uh, I think resilience is uh, the courage to, to start anew, right? And as they say, in order to have uh, resilience, you have to find humor and irony to the situation. Otherwise, it could be really toxic and you could be paralyzed and and completely not do anything, right? So I agree with you, like a bamboo you got to be uh, flexible versus the oak that perhaps wouldn't wouldn't move or budge and they end up breaking, right? So um, uh, unlike your background, my, uh, you know, I, I have a maternal grandfather who was a director and uh, proudly he was um, a Hall of Fame uh, a movie director in Asia and uh, he's also a national artist uh, in my country. So I do see and I do uh, understand what you're saying with regards to the qualities that one need to have in order to, to thrive and, and um, you know, be iconic <laughs> uh, in, in the industry. Uh, so yeah. to, to wrap it up, uh, Gustavo, how can our audience uh, support you in this project? Well, I, unfortunately, the movie is not online yet. I mean, we are talking with some streaming channels, and, and, but nothing has been confirmed yet. So I know it can be difficult to find the movie and to watch it if you're not following the, 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 the film festival circuit where the movie has been shown. Um, but I think the, the best way to support the movie is just to talk about it. If you think... Uh, if you think it matters to you, then talk about it, and 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 I think that's it's actually the best way to support it. Mm -hmm. Just and don't let it die. Don't let it die inside you. Keep it alive. Keep it inside you. Keep the music alive. <laughs> no, no, and that's what we're doing here. So keep the music um, alive. Um, now, with regards to um, to where to find you, if they so film festival, I um, I heard that this film actually won the I mean several awards, and the recent one is from the Tokyo Film Festival, right? Yeah. Yes. So we got this award, uh, the Short Shorts Film Festival in Asia. It's an Oscar qualifying film festival, and because we won this festival. Now the, the the movie is eligible for nomination at the, the Academy Awards. Um, so we're going to start a campaign now, starting from November until the Oscars uh, next year. We're starting a campaign, and we are probably showing the movie in some venues in, in New York and in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm super excited about this. It's my first Oscar campaign. And uh, I'm very excited to see what are the next steps. You, you, you mentioned about your dreams. So after making this film, did it still recur? Or do you think that dream just led you uh, to, to making this film? I'm curious. <laughs> um, so the dream I was talking about is um, the dream about my first love. I didn't mention that. But in, in those dreams in the farm... I, I had my ever first love. It was a girl I met when I was 13 years old, and I fell in love for her. So, yeah, no, I, I don't think she will ever go away. Even after this movie is done, I will always remind me of her, and, and the memory of her will always be with me. Oh, nice. It came in a dream language. I had to interpret, right, oh, and, and transform it into a script. 
Right. Yeah. So that's, yeah, exactly. It didn't come as a full story. It came as a dream. So I had images, I had moments, I have characters from my past. And uh, one thing I like to do every morning, and I really recommend this, is just write down anything that comes up to your mind. Just fill one or two pages with any thoughts that come up to your mind. And when I was dreaming, when I was having those dreams, all I could write about was about those dreams. So little by little, I started to see a story there. Oh, if I move this scene here, if I put that scene there, and all of a sudden I had, you know, a narrative flow. That is so crazy, Gustavo. You know, I also have a dream log, and that's what I do. Um, first moment when I wake up, regardless whether it's 3 a.m., 4 a.m., I just try to, to jot it down as fresh as possible. It's all in my phone, in my uh, notepad here. Uh, but I have started uh, doing that since July 2016. So you could just imagine there's quite uh, a lot there. But uh, it, it's very, um, it's very fascinating. There, yeah. It's fascinating, you know, what all those... Um, the images, as you said, the images and kind of the underlying messages that you make out of it, right? <laughs> this wraps up our show. I really had an amazing time uh, chatting with you, wishing you continued success. Thank you. Thank you, Melody, for this opportunity. It was a great pleasure to be with you. And for all the dreamers out there, keep believing. You got this. Till next time. <laughs>